Thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Evelyn. This will be a dual act, uh, a double act between uh, Lenny and myself. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the ideal conceptual pathway to learning about treatments in this disease, give a little bit of an update on um, how we've expanded. Lenny will then focus on uh, a substantial number of challenges um, that we face and uh, are facing. Um, and then uh, it'll come back to me to just with a single slide uh, refer to some of the issues that are um, relevant to um, the possible utilisation of REMAPCAP as a platform for the evaluation of unregistered uh, medicines. I should also start by just acknowledging um, uh, the, the great many funders. Um, there's um, a set of philanthropic uh, funders, but I do want to mention the NHMRC, the HRC in New Zealand, uh, the European Union, uh, Horizon 2020, uh, CIHR and NIHR, um, all, uh, all of whom um, have um, uh, been um, uh, uh, funding supporters uh, of the study. It's a relatively small number of us on the call, and so I think it's a small enough number that if anyone wants to chip in with a question as we go, we can probably do that and make it um, more interactive and uh, less um, uh, didactic. So um, I want to just start by um, a few sort of um, conceptual comments. Um, I want to start with what would represent a sort of a conceptual understanding of what in ideal circumstances needs to be learned about a new disease uh, when it appears. And a pandemic provides um, a relatively uh, unusual conjunction of circumstances. Um, here we have uh, in COVID a disease of enormous uh, public health importance, but absolutely no prior knowledge about what treatments um, are effective. A lot of speculation based on mechanism, but no empiric evidence about what's uh, effective. And so in January, the world literally started uh, with a blank canvas. I do think it's really important to uh, pay tribute uh, to the large pragmatic trials, uh, recovery and solidarity. Um, they are enormous achievements. And as a consequence of those trials, we know and much, much more about the treatment effect uh, of several uh, interventions. But I'm also going to suggest uh, that in this, within this conceptual framework, as important as those trials are, they can only take us a certain uh, amount of distance. Um, REMAP-CAP is a Bayesian adaptive platform trial. And what that means is it's designed to determine the optimal set of treatments, i.e. the combination of treatments that are optimal for patients with uh, for, for different defined subgroups of patients. Now, whether or not remap cap will achieve that uh, remains to be seen, but that's essentially what it's uh, been uh, designed uh, to do. So I'll just start by saying what I believe to be the goal of clinical trials for COVID, which is to provide guidance to clinicians on optimal treatment, which may vary depending on defined baseline characteristics, and critically importantly, to provide that guidance as soon as possible. Now, we're a Bayesian trial, and so as to maintain uh, the Bayesian theme, I'm going to discuss uh, some priors with respect to the principles of trial science uh, as they apply uh, to COVID. So these are my personal beliefs, and some of them have been influenced by accumulating uh, evidence, and some of them uh, remain uh, speculative uh, priors. The first of those priors is the differential treatment effect by severity of um, a different, the, the, the treatment effect may differ um, amongst treatments dependent on severity of disease at time of initiation of treatment. And so in this slide, there's a large number of patients with mild symptoms, a smaller number of patients who get admitted to hospital. They, some of those progress uh, to needing oxygen and a small proportion uh, become critically ill. And it's quite, uh, it's not reasonable to presume that because a treatment is effective in one of those states, 
that it is automatically going to have the same treatment effect or even the same direction of treatment effect um, in other categories uh, of patients. And we already have proof of concept, at least for one treatment in that regard, with evidence that dexamethasone has differential, uh, a heterogeneity of treatment effect, depending on what in remap cap we refer to uh, as uh, state. So state at time of treatment initiation can be important. And that has implications for trial design. Another prior is that treatment effect might differ by setting. The pathways to death for patients in this sort of hospital in sub-Saharan Africa are likely to be different to the pathways to death that occurs in an intensive care in, the, in a country uh, with um, uh, substantial amounts of resource. And what that means is that trial design needs to take into account that treatment effect may differ by setting. Some further priors. I think it's obvious to us all that the universe of candidate treatments is extremely large. One of my priors yet to be uh, fully evaluated, obviously, is that most of these candidate treatments will turn out to be ineffective uh, or harmful, but all need to be evaluated and evaluated as quickly as possible. The universe of repurposed treatments is much larger than the universe of novel unlicensed agents. And at least so far within this pandemic, the track record of repurposed treatments appears to be stronger than the um, uh, um, uh, uh, treatment effect of novel unlicensed agents, but the pipeline of novel unlicensed agents is probably growing. And lastly, I wanna make some comment about empiricism, i.e. using a trial and randomizing people to see what works versus speculation based on mechanism. I'd just like to relate the anecdote that there were a great many members of the remap cap uh, international trial steering committee who were utterly ambivalent about evaluating corticosteroids. Their prior was that corticosteroids would be ineffective uh, or harmful. And that was translated into the enthusiasm that the sites in remap cap had for evaluating corticosteroids with a substantial number of sites not participating because they did not believe that the treatment uh, were effective. And I just want to emphasize that as much as we understand about mechanism, that empiric approaches um, generate um, the truth with respect to uh, treatment effect. Um, and the additional prior is that for patients with sufficient severity to warrant hospital admission, it's highly unlikely that there will ever be a single curative treatment and what that means is that we need to understand the best combination of treatments, i.e. the optimal treatment regime. And lastly, time is critical because every week of earlier knowledge of effective treatment is uh, a very large number of lives uh, saved. Now, all of these priors um, provide very substantial challenges uh, for trial science. Ideally, we want to be able to evaluate multiple treatments simultaneously. We want to be able to evaluate the treatment effect of combinations of treatment, i.e. have a design that is factorial. We want to analyze frequently so that we get answers as soon as possible without excessive statistical cost. We want to recruit in different settings and levels of severity. We want to be able to generate separate treatment effect depending on setting and severity. And because this is a Bayesian world, we want to be able to borrow between states and setting um, as much as the data supports. And ideally, uh, there's a need for access to large sample size as quickly as possible. So I'll just go in a slightly different direction for a moment to illustrate one of those points. Here we have the results of two hypothetical trials. They both have a standard of care control Treatment A is better than standard of care and treatment B is better than st uh, um, standard of care. And these represent treatments with different mechanisms uh, of action. But unfortunately, each of those trials in isolation still doesn't really help clinicians know what treatments to administer to their patients. They know that they should be giving uh, A or B but what they don't know is whether or not to give A and B. 
because until the combination of A and B are tested within a trial, it's not known whether the combination results in even lower mortality, that there's an additive or synergistic effect, or whether adding one to the offer to the other offers no meaningful advantage, or even the possibility that they are an antagonistic combination and that tr patients treated with both will have a uh, worse outcome. This can only be evaluated by factorial designs in which patients are, are randomised within the two by two tables specified by standard of care, the two treatments and the combination. So this is the current structure of a massively multifactorial trial uh, remap cap. Uh, at the top of that table in an antiviral domain, we're currently evaluating standard of care and lopinavir ritinavir. We previously had hydroxychloroquine and the combination of those two antivirals available, but have dropped those uh, uh, second two interventions based on external information. We have uh, an immune modulation domain that compares standard of care, interferon, anakinra, and two interleukin-6 uh, receptor antagonists. We had previously a uh, corticosteroid uh, domain, but that has also uh, ceased recruitment uh, based on external information from recovery. And we've been able to publish our own results with respect to hydrocortisone, um, uh, demonstrating that it has similar treatment effects uh, to dexamethasone. So the remaining current domains that are active are a standard of care versus convalescent plasma, a DVT prophylaxis versus anticoagulation, a standard of care versus vitamin C. Oh, I've got a, um, um, a, uh, a duplicate in there. Um, a standard of care versus aspirin versus uh, a P2Y12 inhibitor, a standard of care versus statin and um, uh, azithromycin or other macrolides for a short course versus uh, a long course. And um, the domains that a site participates in uh, can be selected as one or more uh, of these. Um, preferably uh, more because that promotes the speed with which we evaluate questions, as well as allowing combinations of treatment uh, to be uh, evaluated. Since January, uh, we've recruited um, just over 1,600 patients uh, with suspected or proven COVID. But because of the multi-domain, uh, um, the multifactorial nature of REMAP-CAP, that corresponds to approximately 2,700 uh, domain level uh, randomizations with up to, this, up to six domains uh, per patient. Um, I don't wanna to sound too defensive, uh, but in a trial uh, with three times as many uh, um, um, uh, endpoints uh, as uh, hospital-based trials, um, that essentially is giving us uh, the same statistical power um, as a hospital-based trial with eight or 9,000 uh, patients uh, randomised. We've expanded from 50 sites to 267 sites and expanded from 13 uh, to 18 uh, countries. And this is a list of the countries in which we were recruiting uh, back in January and the countries in which we are um, uh, recruiting uh, currently. And um, this is also probably an opportune moment to just uh, acknowledge the extraordinary infrastructure that is available in the United Kingdom uh, through the NIHR. We've uh, very substantially increased the number of sites in the UK and the resources that are available to support recruitment in that location have just been stunning um, and an absolute tribute to the uh, creation of the NIHR. Uh, this slide is a week or so uh, old and we're recruiting currently at the rate of about uh, 130 to 150 patients uh, a week. Um, it includes the old remap cap non-pandemic uh, domains, um, but you can see there in the gray bars, um, the recent uh, um, early updated recruitment uh, across a range of uh, the pandemic domains that I uh, uh, ran through. Both the statins, and the antiplatelet domain, I think went live uh, this morning um, in the UK, and I'm yet to see an email suggesting that we've had our first recruitment um, in those uh, new domains. 
So remap cat was an expansion uh, of an existing trial. It does have uh, a complex design, and that design has lots of potential advantages. Um, and I, but I think it's still too early to understand uh, if uh, those potential advantages uh, will be realised. What I would say is it has been, it would have been utterly impossible to have even attempted the level of complexity that exists in remap cap without the trial having been established pre uh, previously. Um, we are fond of saying there's an enormous number of moving parts and it's really difficult um, in a presentation to give a, um, a, a full uh, understanding of the complexity of many of those moving parts. But there are, uh, as a consequence of the adaptations, frequent changes in the software that is used to evaluate eligibility and allocate patients with respect to platform domain and intervention eligibility, updates to the CRF, many challenges associated with site education, as Lenny will outline enormous complexity and challenges associated with contracts. But because of the frequency with which the model has been changing, major problems with data flow and statistical model uh, that Lenny will also uh, allude to. And none of that would have been remotely possible if we tried to launch this uh, from scratch. So what I'll do now is uh, stop sharing my screen um, and throw to Lenny, uh, who's going to run through um, uh, in more detail um, uh, about the challenges uh, that we've been facing. Thanks, uh, Steve. Um, just trying to get the slides up properly. Um, so, so thanks, Steve, for, for running through all the complexities and the reasons why uh, of remap cap. What I'll try and do now is focus on the kind of operational side of the challenges that we've had. And I think the first thing to say is that we've done all this um, in a society that has changed kind of beyond my imagination. So when we were planning this, we always thought, you know, we know a pandemic affects many aspects of life, but I, I never thought it would feel like, and this is why I have this slide up, it felt, it really feels like I've swallowed the red pill and I'm now in some, you know, parallel universe of the, of the matrix where everything has changed. Uh, you know, my, my work in the ICU is not my work in the ICU anymore. We have scaled up to about 300% capacity. We have worked with non-ICU personnel. We've experienced shortages like we've never experienced. Uh, our home lives have been different, you know, homeschooling, uh, uh, the fact that you can't see friends and family, uh, planes are not flying, Olympic Games and, and Tour de France have been cancelled or, or delayed. I see my colleagues on national televisions, you know, you know on a daily basis, uh, society has really changed. And for the research, uh, that has been affected by all of that as well. So nothing has really stayed uh, the same. And... Um, in terms of challenges um, and uh, uh, things we've had to overcome, um, I try to see whether there's one aspect of the trial that these challenges are in, but it's actually not. It's actually each of the components of running a trial, which if I put it down in one kind of visual looks like this, where you start with funding and then you, you know, go to write a protocol, submit that to regulators, uh, startup sites, uh, write a CRF, collect your data, and then analyze and, and write it up and then there are then there is external uh, uh, factors uh, challenges have occurred in each of these uh, uh, steps of our route during this pandemic and i'll try to address uh, some of those or all of those actually um, so in terms of funding that was a challenge mainly at the beginning of the pandemic uh, we were trying to land uh, funding to to get the research going because we knew we were going to have to you know, recruit personnel and do a lot of work. And that took uh, a, a discrepant amount of time in the beginning of the pandemic, writing grants also with multiple partners, new partners across the globe. That was quite challenging. And I think where we have succeeded, uh, if I look back on that, it's actually been based on trust. So uh, Evelyn, you know, I, I really have to uh, thank you and many other people, but you are here uh, for this because in the EU, 
Uh, I think the trust that the European Union has in, in this project has been amazing and has been instrumental to us being able to ramp up uh, like we did. And I know for Steve, a similar thing has happened, you know, based on trust with uh, uh, the Mindaroo Foundation. Um, and this is also true for other funds that we've uh, landed in this pandemic. Uh, so, so funding has been a challenge, but we've been able to succeed based on, I think, uh, trust and the work we've done together before. Um, moving to the second step, writing the protocol. Um, so I think most of you know that the protocol of Remap Cap is quite uh, complex. It has a modular structure where we have a core protocol that like an umbrella holds all the domain specific appendices. And luckily we'd, we'd started writing uh, a pandemic appendix to the core protocol as we call that uh, to kind of put all the information in that would be different in a pandemic from your traditional core protocol. Um, but we did have to amend that based on the specifics of this pandemic. So that took a bit of time. Um, we also had to create a new state. We had to create the pandemic state. We had created an influenza stratum in the trial um, because we thought that would be the most likely cause of uh, a disease in, this, in, in a pandemic if that would ever occur or when that would occur but it turned out to be this new coronavirus. So we had to create a new state for that. And that had uh, some uh, statistical consequences uh, that maybe at the end of my slides, uh, um, uh, Scott can allude to a little bit. And as Steve has already told you, we've uh, uh, ramped up eight new domains and two more are coming, a ventilation and an ACE inhibitor uh, domain. So if you think about us creating four domains between 2014 and 2020, uh, so that's six years, and then we create twice as much in the last six months. So, so that uh, kind of says something about the challenge it's been uh, to write that protocol. And all these protocols have to be completely aligned, completely fit in with each other like Tetris or Lego blocks uh, would fit onto each other. The Third step in that timeline of doing a trial is the approvals. And there have been a, a couple of challenges on that front as well. Um, one of the challenges is that this, this design is still relatively unknown to many IRBs. Uh, so then they tend to reject something that they don't know. So that's caused us uh, some pain in, in places where they are not familiar with adaptive platform trials. Um, from a European perspective, there have been countries where governments were interfering with the treatment that they thought were good. And, uh, you know, as Steve said, if you look back at the advices uh, that, that governments gave in April and, you know, what we now know about steroids and about hydroxychloroquine, uh, then I think it makes the case even stronger for, you know, trialing it and not just doing it. Um, and as I said, it's been especially challenging in the EU, not because the EU is kind of less accommodating, but because we have a lot of member states to consider. Uh, we work in 12 uh, countries across Europe currently, and we are starting up sites in another eight. So I expect uh, in the next uh, month or two, we'll be active in 20 European countries. Uh, we're having very constructive conversations about how we can address this. But in the last six to eight months, it has been extremely challenging. You have to imagine that you have to submit different forms in different languages with different summaries uh, and different strategies of submission in every single country. Um, and I think if I look back and think, you know, what's been the success in regulatory and ethical approvals? It's been that, you know, where experience was already present in these committees, it's been a bit smoother. Um, so I think that also kind of argues for pandemic research preparedness and, you know, uh, informing people also about these types of trials. Um, very practical, practical kind of from the, from the project management and site selection point of view. Uh, that's also been a, a challenge. Um, a lot of sites were overwhelmed by research proposal in the beginning of the pandemic. And kind of when that went away and the first wave of COVID went away, uh, these sites became a bit COVID tired. And, you know, over the summer, it was really hard to get, to get sites to, uh, to join this initiative. Uh, contracts is, is always challenging because every single uh, participating site has their own legal department with their own rules. And, you know, these rules are different 
not just across continents or across countries, but even you know, between institutions. Um, there have been uh, successes. Um, uh, as, as Steve said, especially in the UK, this is something that was very well organized. Just to give you an example, we were able to start up over a hundred sites in the UK in the time frame of four weeks. Uh, and I think that's really amazing, but it's largely due to the fact that, you know, things are very well organized in this respect in the UK. And that's just one of the 12 countries we, we work in. Also doing site initiation visits and doing training, doing that all digital and also producing those materials uh, has, uh, has been challenging, uh, but we've managed to, to do that. Um, and, and I told you about the successes. I, I think where established structures were, it was a little bit more easy. So then when we've start, started up a site, um, we then need to manage that site. It sounds a bit weird, but uh, so we have to monitor, we have to get informed consent uh, from the patients uh, or, or uh, have the conversation with them. Um, we also had to organize all the logistics and contracting for medication. So some of the med medication that we use is expensive. Uh, obviously uh, we are happy if the the producers of those medications can supply those, especially because in the first wave, some of the medication was really scarce. It was hard to, to get it clinically. Uh, so uh, getting those contracts in place has really helped, but getting a contract in place with a pharmaceutical company between five recruiting regions uh, has not been easy uh, at times. And the logistics of medication are quite challenging, uh, especially if you're working across uh, multiple countries. Uh, and then also, you know, everything that was going on within the trial, and this relates to something I'll come back to a little bit later, also has to be kind of translated to the site. So the streamlining of information has been especially challenging. Um, what we uh, have learned now is that, especially if you have so many domains up and running, you may have a PI at a site that you kind of feel is the main person at that site responsible for the trial. But different domains have different what we call champions, you know, people who pull the chart of that domain and they want to be in the information uh, uh, chain as well. So streamlining that, making sure we don't communicate with 10 different people in one site, but do keep everybody uh, up to speed and up to date. Uh, that's been uh, a challenge as well. Uh, and again, here, uh, success is made by relationships established before the pandemic. Um, Steve starts a little bit on the CRF. Um, I think we have a well-designed CRF um, and the eligibility system makes sure that people don't have to worry about, you know, time windows and everything like that across domains, which would be impossible. But it also means it has about eight pages of logic behind it. Uh, so it's quite complex to build. And every time you add a new domain, that interferes with a lot of the pathways um, uh, in that uh, CRF. Um, in addition to that, CRF works across multiple data providers. Um, and in the US, uh, the data are actually extracted from the electronic health records. Uh, so that's another challenge to get that all exactly the same way. And then getting the right data to our statistics uh, um, uh, advisory committee with all the changes to the platform, um, you know, that, that uh, continuous updating has been a true challenge and it's still challenging today. Um, I already referred to a little bit uh, uh, to, to external factors. Um, so what we continuously try to do is try to incorporate the results from other studies into REMAPCAP. So I think that went uh, very well with the corticosteroids. Um, it was uh, a, a, you know, a real kind of a pilot for us to see if that would work and it, it does, uh, but keeping uh, on top of all that literature that's changing so fast, uh, that alone is uh, is challenging. We're lucky we have a big uh, big group, uh, so we try to uh, uh, to do that. Um, just to give you an example of how that works practically, before the pandemic, I think once every three to four months we had an ITSC meeting, and we've had them weekly uh, for about eight months, and still we need to contact each other you know, regularly in between these ITSC meetings, just, you know, to, to discuss things like this, like incorporating results from other studies. Uh, our investigator group, you can imagine, has expanded quite a lot uh, because of the expanding domains and also because of the expanding uh, regions. 
Um, what we also find very important is to collaborate with other studies. Uh, we've uh, had a couple of successes there, I think. Uh, we have uh, completely integrated with the Active 4 initiative from the NIH, as well as the uh, ATTAC uh, trial on, on anticoagulation. So that's a true prospective meta-analysis. Uh, I think that's a great accomplishment, uh, but it is very challenging to get you know, all the noses in the same direction. And we're trying with uh, more trials that cannot uh, uh, fulfill their re recruitment uh, to, to work with them and, and um, also make seamless phase two, phase three transitions and stuff like that. And a last thing that's been, you know, quite easy in principle, but uh, hard to execute is data sharing and publication policies. So, you know, it's very easy that we want um, credit to give credit where credit is due in publication and we want to share data as much as we can. Those principles are very easy. But how you kind of organize that with all these funders, with all these institutions, with all these investigators uh, that all have a slightly different take on this, uh, that's uh, quite a challenge uh, in itself. So that's the external factors um, influencing uh, uh, remap cap. And then the last challenge, and I know Steve uh, will laugh out loud, so I hope he has his microphone muted, is the challenge of time zones. So this is not a remap cap slide, and it includes regions like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the Southern Americas, where we are currently not recruiting. But uh, we do have investigators on the west coast of the US. We do have investigators on the east coast of Australia. And we even have investigators, and they may be hidden under your uh, kind of speaker frame in, in New Zealand. And getting all these people in all these time zones on calls is uh, quite challenging at times. And we've all had to get up in the middle of the night. Um, I think kind of the, um, the, the passion of the investigators is, is shown by the fact that Trin is here, the Scott is here, even though it's quite early. I know Steve regularly has 6 a.m. meetings. I've been up after midnight doing, doing meetings. Um, so, so we all, all do that, but it is a challenge. So um, we've jokingly said that we would really appreciate uh, if the world was flat. Um, there are advantages to these time zones because sometimes one region can work while the other sleeps and we can flick each other work uh, overnight. Uh, but this is just a very practical problem um, uh, that's you know, difficult in a, in a global trial. Um, so that brings me to kind of uh, a, a very short summary of what I think the challenges have been and how we are trying to fix those. And I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to consolidate what we've built in the last six to eight months. We're continuously updating and improving our structures, uh, you know, trying to compartmentalize things and, and uh, speak about rules and responsibilities. Um, another thing we're really trying to do is we're trying to engage uh, regulators. We're trying to engage sites. Uh, we're doing that by, you know, giving information uh, having presentations, uh, we've set up a, a media campaign, uh, and we are also preparing the pipeline uh, to include investigational, true investigational novel drugs into remap cap. And I think that uh, is for me the time to hand back uh, to Steve, so he can share with you his last slide on where we are with preparing remap cap for uh, being a regulator trial, regulatory trial. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Lenny. I've just got um, one slide on that to show and then a little bit of a summary. Hope that's um, uh, uh, presenting okay. So um, not mentioned in any of the domains that either Lenny or I have uh, referred to at this stage um, is um, uh, an additional uh, separate domain uh, that uh, contains two um, um, uh, uh, agents uh, with immune modulatory uh, properties. Uh, one is a registered, uh, an existing registered drug looking for a new indication. Uh, and the other is a um, uh, unlicensed uh, uh, medicine, a completely novel investigational medical product. So there's been um, substantial um, 
uh, liaison uh, with the FDA. Um, and um, uh, we have um, agreement uh, with the FDA um, that the design that we've put together for this domain um, is regarded as uh, acceptable for um, uh, regulatory submission. It's not regarded uh, uh, as exploratory. Uh, Scott may wish to comment or make um, uh, any additions to things that I've uh, missed out. Um, but the major design features um, that were sufficient to acquire um, uh, FDA agreement um, were that there's no use of the response adaptive randomization which exists in uh, other domains. Um, rather, there's a fixed and balanced randomization between standard of care and these two investigational agents. Um, there's a fixed maximum uh, sample size, and that's one feature that is used to try and reduce um, uh, the risk of type 1 error that can occur if the sample size uh, is unlimited. We've also uh, reduced to a fixed uh, small number the number of interim analyses at which platform conclusions can be reached uh, so that it's not the case of a statistical confidence being achieved when the trial just falls over uh, the statistical uh, trigger. Um, there will be uh, blinding uh, within that domain. Um, everything else in remap cap, uh, trying to keep it as pragmatic as possible uh, is open label. Um, but uh, for regulatory submission, we've been able to institute uh, blinding. And because these are drugs with uncertain safety profile um, in this patient population, appropriately, there's quite substantial um, enhanced uh, safety uh, monitoring. So I'll just finish by, uh, this is a, a concluding slide. Um, a remap caps a Bayesian adaptive platform trial. Um, it's designed to evaluate multiple candidate interventions as fast as possible. Uh, it permits uh, the um, um, identification of different measures of treatment effect by severity uh, state. And although I didn't cover it, we are close to launching sites in India, Pakistan, Nepal. Uh, in negotiations uh, with sites uh, in Colombia. And uh, if we have sufficient sites in low and middle income countries, we're in a position to also evaluate differential treatment effect depending on uh, setting. But where there is congruent treatment effect, we'll be uh, borrowing uh, as we do between severity states. We're working towards determination of an optimal uh, treatment regime. And that comes from the evaluation of pre-specified interactions amongst all of those different uh, domains, as well as the capacity to evaluate post hoc interactions between interventions in different domains that have been uh, concluded. I think it's fair to say, as Lenny has outlined, we have had uh, major uh, operational challenges, um, which I think we are in the process of uh, working through. Um, but uh, as with all clinical trials, we could definitely do uh, with more sites um, and more uh, statistical uh, power. So um, I hope that's been a little bit of a uh, guide to where things are at uh, with, um, uh, with remap cap. Yeah, abs absolutely outstanding. Sharu, before I say anything, I know you've got to go. As the new chair of Glopadar, do you want to say anything before you leave? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, I am so encouraged. So congratulations to all of you, because this is the way to go. Uh, you know, as Glopadar members, uh, we are uh, constantly discussing how to increase efficiency and decrease the time and uh, we knew this before the pandemic and after the pandemic, it's even more obvious that, uh, you know, multilateral clinical trials and multilateral uh, initiatives are the way to go to increase efficiency. So uh, I know it's, it's challenging. I heard that, but uh, uh, I think it's so important uh, to show the way of the future and you're doing that. And I'm particularly encouraged to hear that the LMICs are being included because Steve, as you said, 
you know, it's so important to make sure that it, this works in different settings. So i uh, very encouraged to hear that. And I just want to uh, congratulate the whole group and uh, just say, you know, um, I know it's not over yet, but we have to power through. So thanks so much uh, for your, all your efforts. Yeah, no, I, I, um, Scott, um, anything you want to add before I open the floor? No, no, uh, happy to discuss any questions about stats or the science of the trial, uh, but nothing to add. Okay, great. Well, um, having, I mean, if I reflect back, Steve, to 2011 and hearing you and Derek Angus and being on some calls listening to, to Scott, um, speak about this and um, I think at that point we used to refer to it as Gag Sari to see where it's got to now is just miraculous and and I know you know I mean never lose the joy of that moment you, you guys have stuck at this for what pretty much a decade and I know Scott's work going back even longer than that with other um, disciplines so really well done um, and thank you for what you've done um, for science and, and to help treat the population. Um, I mean, what struck me, Lenny, listening um, to you was that all the operational lessons learned, and I think in all the preparedness we've done across the board for outbreaks, I think what we're realising now painfully is that we never went into enough operational detail. And so I know the science is fantastic and, and that's the thing that's usually published, but it would be great to get some kind of operational piece on this because you guys have lived and made history during this pandemic. And, and surely people are gonna build on the work of this going forward. And so it would be great to capture that. Also your point about data sharing. Um, so you've got some of the Glopadar uh, members here and actually probably representative of the groups who are most interested in drive forward data sharing from the funders perspective. And there is a roadmap for um, Glopadar members and data sharing and Thomas Janish is on the call, who's obviously led this from the researcher perspective for a number of years. Um, so we'd be certainly happy to discuss that with you. Um, uh, perhaps in a, in a separate call. I, I don't want to, to dominate this call with it. Um, so Evelyn, over to you and, um, and then if there's any questions from the floor, but thank you very much and well done. Yeah, uh, thanks from my side also. I, I'm, Gail has always the right words uh, to praise you properly, I'm not even going to try, but I fully uh, subscribe to what uh, she said, uh, you know. And uh, I understand that uh, Charu is also very enthusiastic, so really great. And thanks a lot for having taken the time to go through, uh, take us through this. Um, my main question uh, at this stage would be, like how do you see a role for this working group specifically or Globe with R, uh, in general on um, how to address some of the issues um, that you have experienced? And indeed, uh, I was also thinking about the data sharing, but uh, that's uh, it's a huge challenge that uh, we're all uh, dealing with. But I think I would agree that, yeah, with Globedar that there's uh, probably uh, room for further work uh, on this. But so that would be my first question. And uh, uh, second is with regards to the regulatory, that's a, a big challenge also on European level. And I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts about this? Because from what I see, the, the kind of uh, the compromise that have been made well I, I guess it's needed but it's a uh, it also takes a bit away of the uh, the, the 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 strength or the, the specificity but I'm sure you feel that way so I don't want to uh, um, really, uh, emphasize that too much but at the same time just thinking do you have a feeling that the regulatory will kind of slowly maybe not now but maybe move in a different direction where they would also accept the response adaptive design and and other aspects so that would be a second question and third 
is maybe your uh, I, I I don't want to be um, negative, but I do have a feeling that um, I mean the hospital based studies are going faster with uh, developing results uh, or uh, generating uh, results. Am I wrong in that perception? And specifically, is it, yeah, is it the the the, the complexity that kind of holds back in going? Moving faster. I don't. I don't know because, and just to, and I, I, I will uh, stop then. But the thing is, there was so much work has been going into the in preparing and getting this ready, and then, yeah, you see these hospital-based study, especially like the recovery study, that then comes up very fast with uh, results, and I'm just wondering what your views are uh, on that. And uh, yeah, over. Thanks, Evelyn. Let me take those in turn, and then I will see if Lenny or Scott want to uh, contribute. So I think there were three questions there. One was um, related to data sharing. One was re related to the value of the platform with respect to regulatory approval. And the other was the um, uh, balance between uh, large pragmatic trials, which can generate answers quickly, versus the complexity of uh, remap cap. So, so just in terms of data sharing, I think it's worth drawing a distinction between what might be referred to um, as uh, prospective meta-analysis, where um, multiple um, published or unpublished uh, trials uh, share aggregate data uh, to uh, try and generate conclusions uh, more rapidly. Um, and Srin, who's on the call, has been a very important part of that, led by the WHO. Um, there is a, um, in my opinion, um, a better, perhaps, or certainly more ambitious uh, model of data sharing, which is the one that is being used by um, Remap Cap, uh, Attack, uh, and Active4, which is the sharing of individual patient data within the same statistical model. That requires some degree of harmonization, but it doesn't require absolute harmonization. And the actual data set that is used by Scott within that uh, statistical model is relatively uh, small. And um, uh, I don't know if, it, if either the politics or the logistics are possible but it would certainly be much better if we had pathways for sharing individual patient data within pre-specified statistical models of the type that Scott uh, runs, rather than the more static aggregate uh, prospective, uh, aggregate data uh, prospective uh, meta-analyses. With respect to the regulatory framework, I perhaps um, didn't emphasize that the FDA are um, more than happy for that domain to exist within the existing multifactorial structure. So there, are, there is no problem with patients contributing to the antiplatelet domain or an antiviral domain um, uh, or uh, vitamin C, as well as the domain that will be used for regulatory submission. And the um, restrictions in terms of not using response adaptive randomization, a fixed maximum sample size, and um, a smaller number of interim analyses are really only a very minor uh, um, uh, decrement in the overall use of the uh, platform uh, structure. And then lastly, you are absolutely right that trials like recovery and solidarity have been good at generating answers about the effectiveness of single treatments. What they're not well prepared to do is progress through the next layer of understanding, which is about the contingent relationships between multiple different treatments. 
as I showed in those slides, two trials that both show a benefit of different treatments still need a second trial of the sort of design that Remap Cap has to move us towards understanding what are the optimal combination of treatments. There's no doubt that simple pragmatic designs like uh, recovery and solidarity have allowed us to answer the initial questions, but I think it remains to be determined whether those designs have the flexibility to answer the next set of questions because they are a somewhat more static uh, design. Thanks, uh, Steve. Very helpful. I think maybe Thomas, I don't know if you want to come in with regards to the data. Yes, yes. I was just going to ask a question about data sharing. Um, so in Recoded, the aim that we are working towards is the combination of the clinical epidemiological data and the high dimensional data, which in many cases is sequencing data, but can also be array data, uh, omics data. And um, I was thinking about all the groups that you have presented. Um, in, in Recoded, most of the emphasis is on observational cohort data. So there's a lot of standard of care control groups that could potentially be of use for, for, for Recoded. So Recoded is reconciliation of cohort data for infectious diseases. And we really focus on the data sharing and harmonization aspect of that. So I was going to explore with you to what extent that would be possible to, to share, especially the, the data from the control groups. Um, um, Thomas, I'm, I'm sure we can, uh, can look into that. As Lenny has outlined, we have a lot of um, uh, uh, first order challenges with respect to just being able to make the platform work uh, as we grow. Um, we're in a phase at the moment of trying to consolidate uh, a range of processes. We're relatively paused in terms of new domains so that we can make sure that we can execute with the domains uh, that we have. Um, but um, I'm sure as the dust starts to settle and we've got a little bit more time and a little bit more bandwidth, um, that's the sort of, uh, particularly out of the standard of care group, uh, that we can provide. I'll just make the additional comment that if a patient is randomized to six domains, which is the maximum number that we've had it to this stage, but we're frequently seeing patients randomized to four domains, they may be standard of care for only one domain, but they'll be active intervention for the other domains. And it's not uh, like uh, recovery or solidarity where you're either an active treatment or a control, you can be a mixture of uh, control and intervention across multiple domains. Thanks, um, thanks, that helps. And, but is, is there a sequence data generated currently as well? There's no, there's, there's it's, it's, it's in, in terms of virus sequence. Yeah. And no, yes. we're not, no. Uh, there, are a, there are perhaps a few sites in which we can link sequence data to an individual uh, patient. Um, but what we've been trying to do is just set up the contraption mm. to randomize the additional complexity associated with routine sample collection uh, we felt was beyond us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And just, just to add, Thomas, so one of the additional complexities is that, you know, even though the, the data sharing platform that you described makes a lot of sense, there are obviously a lot of groups across the globe that either nationally or internationally are trying to do something similar, you know, from their perspective. And we obviously want to share as much as we can, but um, it's quite a challenge to figure out how to do that with each of these partners without violating all the contracts with, you know, the pharma providing the medication, the grants we're under. Uh, it, it can be done, but it just takes a lot of time to get it right. I understand. Great. Um, Sorry, just, I just wanted to, if Scott wanted to say anything about the uh, process of uh, negotiations with the FDA, 
and our understanding of there potentially being different views at the EMA? Yeah, we've talked to both the FDA and EMA. Um, I, I think they're very comfortable. What's really nice about Remap Cap is each domain can be thought of as a, a registration aspect of the or simple simplifying uh, aspects of those domains for experimental therapies. We were in an interesting case where, uh, of course, a lot of this is new for both regulators. Um, we did that really to make the pathway straightforward. We could have gone response adaptive randomization. We could have done some other things. The sponsors were very comfortable making these simplifying assumptions to make this pathway easy for regulators. Um, uh, so I, I think that process has been nice uh, in the work with regulators within the trial. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, great. Well, unfortunately, um, we're going to have to wrap up because we're going straight into the member, the Blupadar members meeting. But thank you very much. Some of you, like Scott Thomas, are up um, early doors, Srin. So thank you. Steve, you're up late. Again, huge success. Um, there's so much to learn from it. And um, what we'd like to do it, with your permission is to um, put the, we've recorded this and, and to put it onto the collaborative space so all the Glopadar members could have access to it not just the researchers who often join this group, um, because there may well be funders in Globadar who would like to, to set this up in some of the other countries where you, where you don't have a site at the moment. Mind you, I'm listening to you, it sounds as though you're, you've got most of the world covered, but, um, but maybe they could help you. But thank you again. Evelyn, any final words? No, I I remain a big fan and I just uh, wish you good luck and to continue, let's stay in touch. And uh, if there's anything that you think about in terms of from a funder perspective that we can be of support or uh, issues that we could be addressing, uh, let us know. And thanks a lot. Uh, it doesn't get some rest. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Bye now.